first up, we have Sister Gail Zahava, KHO Executive Assistant. You have about 30 minutes. You ready? Can we get a round of applause? Some of us have come pretty far, and we're just excited to be here. And I, first of all, would like to thank our host, Kingdom Harbinger Ministries, for making this event possible. And I'm honored to deliver the opening presentation on the recognition pillar. And as it states there, it is the it is foundational to the achievement of justice and development for our people. So tomorrow, March 25th, it marks the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade, which is the United Nations observance, and it was designated in 2007 to be marked every year on March 25th. And the day honors and remembers those who suffered and died as a consequence of the transatlantic wake up power. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> praise y'all. Um, it's a consequence of the transatlantic slave trade, which has been called the worst violation of human rights. And that's why we see um, for it actually over 400 years of more than 15 million men and women and children were victims. That's heavy. Uh -huh. And you know, I, I know other cultures, other peoples, they make a point of doing something and remembering that. And I think the, um, the permanent memorial that's outside of the UN, that's exactly what it says on there, uh -huh. lest we forget. It's entitled The Ark of Return, and it was designed by the Haitian American architect Rodney um, Leon. So we don't want to forget. We want to remember. We want to remember what our ancestors have been through. And so, therefore, this is an excellent opportunity to discuss the importance of the current situation of our people of African descent in the context of this decade, but also in the context of descent for greatness. It also offers an occasion, and this is really why we're here, to raise awareness among populations and countries. So we got people streaming from all over the world, all over, where we often see that American, African Americans facing discrimination and um, racism goes unnoticed and it goes unaddressed. In many cases, not just in practice, but also in law. So really at the outset, it's well agreed that no part of the world is free of racism and racial discrimination. And the lack of awareness, my, my brother, let me just say this, my brother is a Harvard law attorney, had no idea about this. So the lack, and he, he practices right here in New York. And so the lack of awareness of this, it just lends to that fact that there's, a, there's an issue, there's a problem. And so today we're making a change. We're taking this moment to bring awareness to this very important conversation. So I wanna call your attention to what the International Decade, what it's supposed to do. Let's see, I can, is this, is yeah. this part plugged in oh, to the... <laughs> So, the International Decade presents a viable instrument to address common issues facing people of African descent, such as the following. You ready? Yep. All right. All right. Uh, you have it. Uh, yeah. Excuse the technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. All right. Thank you. All right. Such as the following structural and institutional racial discrimination, xenophobia, Afrophobia, and related intolerance, inequity, marginalization, and stigmatization. Low levels of participation and underrepresentation in political and institutional decision making processes. Lack of adequate representation in the administration of justice. Barriers to inequality and the enjoyment of key human rights, such as access to quality of education, health services, housing, which results in the intergenerational transmission of poverty. Disappropriate presence in prison populations. 
that's my husband and I's passion is to minister outreach to those that are what we call returning citizens. Racial profiling, limited social recognition and valuing of people of African descent, ethnic and cultural diversity and contribution to society and intolerance against religions of African origin. So this is what they would like to have a plan of action to address. And so this meeting presents an important moment and it's for us to know we can make a difference. I want to lend from a quote, the famous statement attributed to Maya Angelou, which says, history, despite the wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. We can be, be the change. We can make a difference. About a year ago, it was April of last year, my husband and I, um, actually, he was trying to get to Florida. So somehow trying to get to Florida, the most I saw fit to get us to Hawaii. <laughs> So he took a job assignment in Hawaii. And once we arrived there, real quickly we realized, because we're on one of the smallest islands of the chain, it's more what they call old Hawaii. It's not very city, it's very country, it's similar to what we like, like gardening and farming. And so it was just perfect. But as soon as we got there, we realized real quickly they were not used to black people. <laughs> And so the property that we were staying on, that we're renting, there is a cottage that's off to the back, detached from the property. And the property owner felt, I guess, obligated to let us know that if she was also renting out a different unit on the property, she had told them that me and my husband were black and she asked them, would they be okay with that? Yeah. That's real deep in 2023, 24. And so I realized that this is again, awareness, recognition, why it's so important. And then I had an opportunity to be a part of the uh, regional meeting for the Asia Pacific on the International Decade for People of African Descent. They had a regional meeting. And as I was preparing for that meeting, I shared with a colleague that I was going and they said, Asia? There's black people in Asia. <laughs> and so it just lets you know that we're everywhere, but people don't always know that. And so to quote the DDPA paragraph 33, it says it's essential for all countries in the regions of the Americas and all other areas of African diaspora to recognize the existence of their population of African descent and the cultural, economic, political, and scientific contribution made by the population and recognize the persistence of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance that specifically affects them. And recognize that in many countries, their longstanding inequality in terms of access to Indalia education, healthcare, housing, has been a profound cause of social economic disparities that affect them. And this brings me to talk about recognition. One of the things I learned from that meeting, and it was surprising to me, is that there are several countries in the Asia Pacific area that have no laws that govern to how to deal with racial discrimination. So in terms of housing, there's a large amount of housing discrimination. They can actually put up signs and say, no Negro, no Black, whatever language it is, that they will not allow them to be in, in housing. I mean. There's work to be done, people. So I want to present today, and I know my time has been abbreviated, the presentation, it will focus on five key roles of recognition of people of African descent. And recognition, recognition, oh, well, before I get into recognition, what is recognition? <laughs> so it is acknowledgement and acceptance of something or someone's existence, validity, or legality. So recognition, again, is very critical. Recognition of people of African descent is the fundamental and essential first step to the fulfillment of and respect of their rights. So this is presentation is going to focus on five key roles of recognition of people of African descent. First and foremost, 
Recognition must be established in the legislation and legal frameworks at the national and local level, as this provides the basis for legal protection of the rights of people of African descent against racial discrimination, which they can equally claim their rights. So what do we want? The outcome of recognition. My husband told me I was going to walk. I said, no, I'm not. Um, the outcome of recognition is that we be seen visibly, undeniably seen. We need a voice, and we, so we need to be heard, and we need to be seen. And so it's through our legal frameworks, it's through legislation that we can make that happen. And one of the things that the decade says is that we have underrepresentation. So we need to get involved, we need to be in strategic places where we can be involved in the decision making. Here it says the outcome of recognition should have unquestionable visibility and the active and proactive voice of African descent across all aspects of political, civic, economic, social, cultural, and environmental life at community and national levels. And so it's so important that we know what's going on within our communities, that we're being a part of our community, and that we're showing up and making a difference. The second point is recognition demonstrates the accurate and respectful representation of history and culture of people of African descent, their role in societal development and their contribution to all aspects of life and living together. So in this regard, we're talking about education. So we would like to see in our curricula, both primary, secondary, college level, our stories, true stories being told. Yeah. Part of that is we can control the message by having our own schools. And so KHM is one of the examples of having a homeschool, being a part of that, being able to educate our children the way they learn, knowing how our culture, our customs, our manners, and being able to raise them with that pride of who we are as a people. So that's extremely important. And I want to use an example. Just This is just something that doesn't come out when you think of, okay, let me ask you a question. Where did most of the slaves that came through the transatlantic slave trade, where did they come from? West and Central Africa. Very true. It says historical documentation indicates that many Africans were taken from the West African coast, but that a large proportion were also taken from the former Portuguese colonies of Angola and Mozambique. That's it. So it's important that we teach our kids the full story, the whole story. We know what that connects us to, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> All right. The third point, I'm going to move along. I could say a lot and spend a lot of time there. But actually, before I get to I want to quote this. Um, it's operational guidelines for the inclusion of people of African descent in the 2030 agenda. 2030 needs to be on our radar. There's something happening in 2030, and we want to be a part of making the change. So it says education has a critical role in mental liberation and symbolic decolonization. Working group chair Barbara Reynolds states, and she stated this at this meeting, and it will forever stay and print it on my mind. Ensuring the accuracy in teaching materials of history could help avoid stereotypes and the distortion of history, which may lead to the reduction of racism and racial discrimination and promote understanding, acceptance, and more inclusion of people of African descent and societies in which they live. I can say that now that my husband and I have been in Hawaii for a year, we go to every neighborhood community meeting. We're a part of the community. We've helped start a uh, farmer's market there. And my husband's with the postal. So they see, you know, it's a small little town. They know everything. You know how it is a little small little town. But it makes a difference because then they see, okay, they live in life just like everybody else. Good citizens, right? But she said this. She said, she intentionally excluded the term tolerance, saying for people of African descent, there's nothing worse than being tolerated. So I don't want to be tolerated. We want to be accepted and be able to stand in who, in who we are with that confidence. 
So thirdly, recognition encompasses the collection of accurate, up-to-date data. Disaggregated by race is required. So why is disaggregated data important? It's because the story can only be told when a full picture is provided through this type of data. So this simply means breaking down large racial and ethnic categories into more detailed specific groups. And when I went to this meeting, the, the Asia Pacific, what is happening is some of the countries or what they call member states are de declining having this done. And they're doing it so that they can ignore the racism problem. So this is why it's so important that we push that this type of disaggregated data be done and also allows adequate provisions and budgetary funding on, that are necessary to provide identifiable basic goods and services. So until we understand the need, until we understand the whole picture and the whole story, this is how st st systemic racism continues to happen because these things are not being broken down and looked at in a more detailed manner. So we wanna, therefore, in advocating recognition of people of African descent, we wanna do meticulous care that needs to be done to prevent the entry of unconscious bias in personnel, discriminatory structures, processes, and procedures. And this will take me, as I'm quickly coming to close, I would love to spend more time, but this will take me to recognition and action. So this is the third and fourth point. So the fourth recognition fourth is includes representation of the issues, concerns, and challenges of people of African descent and overseeing and governing decision-making. So until our people who've had the experiences in the places of governing and leadership and making decisions, they won't understand, they won't know. And I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, New York. <laughs> during the one of the most roughest times of drug and violence that you ever wanted to see. And I had a childhood that in my mind for a long time was very safe. We didn't have to lock the doors, even in Jamaica, Queens, New York, when I was growing up, maybe that's dating me, but uh, <laughs> we didn't have to lock the doors. We didn't have to lock the cars. We were not concerned about our safety or someone robbing us or doing something. And I remember one evening, my mom got a knock at the door and it was the police. And in that instant, they told her that my father had been shot and was in the hospital. And he was in a coma for six days. And he lost, we lost him to that gunshot wound. But then a year and a half later, my mom, who was struggling. And I, I'm sharing this story because until people understand the experiences of our people, I'm one experience, but there are many others. There are those that have lost their parents, their children, their sons, their daughters. And that is in understanding that experience that we can decide, I want to see a change. I believe if my father had some other opportunities, he would not have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was a cab driver and he was a cab driver to provide for his family. But my father had big dreams. He was a dreamer. He wanted to be an entrepreneur and do many more things, but he was doing what he could do with the education that he had to provide for his family. So then a year and a half later, my mother, who really took it very difficult, began to become a social alcoholic and her health failed and she had a stroke, went into a coma. So I was 10 with my father, now 12 with my mother, went into a coma and the same thing in six days, we lost my mother. So as painful and as hard as that was, my sisters were there and we held together. And a year and a half later, because taxi or cab driving was our family business, we all, even me, we all drove cab at one point. My sister, I know, right? My sister was driving cab and was also gunned down, shot twice, and killed. 
So in the span of four years, I lost three immediate family members. Wow. And so when we talk about passion for our people, because my sister got caught up in the drug that was going on during that time in South Jamaica, Queens, New York, and it cost her life. But you know what? It drew me closer to the most high because there's no way in this world I would be standing before you all today. And you know what? The most high would give me if I didn't tell you all this testimony because I didn't want to tell it. <laughs> but he told me to tell it because we need to understand this fourth recognition in terms of representing our issues. We have unique issues, concerns, and challenges that our people face that we have to stand up and we have the ability to get involved and have a voice and be seen making a difference. Okay. Lastly, I want to um, say this. What does that mean? It means we have to have strategic involvement in our community, serving on community boards, school boards, civic groups, community business groups, and social clubs. Likewise, people of African descent must participate in the community and in the national life, in all spheres and at all levels, and don't be apologetic. I don't, they don't, they like, where she come from? They don't have to know where I come from. I just showed up. <laughs> they don't have to know where you came from. Just show up and start doing the work and watch the most high bless as you are obedient to him. Now, these issues are not just limited to our issues. When you get involved in a community, you're going to have to deal with all sorts of issues, but show up. Lastly, recognition encompasses accurate, honest, and respectful representation in media, art, and literature. And this is why I'm so thankful. And, you know, it's kind of like a blessing and a cursing with social media. But the, all the people here that are on social media, that have a social media presence, we are so thankful for y'all. Zion, Ashanda, Divine. Oh my gosh, what if we didn't find you all? Right. You know, we thought we were crazy, right? <laughs> and so it's nice to know that authentic, accurate, honest representation of our people can be done on social media. But it's not just social media, it's traditional and contemporary media. However, we can show up with the honest truth. That's what we need to be a part of. And that's what makes the difference because that changes their perception mm. of us. Uh -huh. So in conclusion, these were the main aspects of recognition to which I wanted to draw your attention to today. We urge leaders and citizens of our country and societies to be aware and intentional in efforts to address the situation of people of African descent to recognize and respect their presence and their contribution to their societies. To achieve this requires political intentionality in accordance with the implementation of non-discrimination obligations that have been undertaken under the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. So therefore, in final review, we wanna have recognition in legislation honest and respectful representation in history and culture, accurate representation in disaggregated data collection, proper representation of the issues, concerns, and challenges of people of African descent, and honest and respectful representation in media is how we enact change and we provide, and here's the key, how can we provide concrete solutions for our people? So I want to say, get involved, get involved. You'll see up here, we say this at KHM often, be the hands and feet of our creator to make a difference and leave a positive indelible print on this world. KHM chapters, chapter launches in various cities and countries all over the world provide a vehicle where we can increase our representation and make a difference in our communities. So through community outreach, we're addressing societal ills, through community legal frameworks that foster empowerment, and through KHM community service and programs, we meet many needs of our people. I want to thank you all for your time today. Can you please, everybody stand up? I know we're getting ready to shift to the next speaker, but I'd like to do one quick exercise before I leave you today. Everyone, please, and you can stretch, too. You've been seven, what's been your long? 
So take a look. Look down at your feet. Everybody, take a look. And you online streaming, you can stand up too. Look down at your feet. And I just want to leave this powerful thought. If you don't move from this place, you'll be here the same place next year. That's so it. get to moving. That's it. That's it. Hallelujah. All right. Thank you, Sister Gail uh, Zahaba. Can we give a round of applause for Gail? That was excellent.